When we talk about steel bracing, the fundamental goal is simple. Create a clear and efficient path to transfer lateral loads to the ground. And here's how I think about it. First, you understand the loads. Then, pick the right type of bracing. And finally, put it in the right place. Very simple. So let me show you the path first. The easiest example for us to get started is with an industrial building. And the most common layout in this type of buildings is with the two end bays braced. So the first bay is braced and the last bay is also braced. I did not model the girts and purlies, but you can imagine that we have girts running horizontal like this. And then we have a wall cladding that encloses the building. So basically the wind is going to blow onto the wall panel. The wall panel will distribute the loads through the girts. Hence the girts will bend and since they are connected to the columns, their reactions will be applied as several point loads along every column, which we simplify as line loads. And as a result, these columns will also bend. So they're going to bend like this, all of them and half of the loads go to the foundation and the upper half of the loads goes to the roof framing. So basically all this tributary area will be distributed to the roof bracing system. The reaction from these columns will be one point load at the bottom and one point load at the top. Each one of these point loads will put these pink members, which are the struts, into compression and the diagonal members in tension. If it makes easier for you to visualize, you can go to a top view and you can tell that this is a beam. It's basically a horizontal truss. You've got the top cord, the bottom cord, the webs and diagonals. So let's follow the load path. This point load will travel through this strut and then this node is gonna stretch this diagonal member. So the force comes this way and then for this strut, we've got this force plus a component of this diagonal member. So that force is going to travel through that strut. And then from there, the process repeats itself. It's going to stretch this diagonal member. So the force travels through the diagonal. And then when it gets to this point, this pink strut will take this point load plus a component of this diagonal load. So the force is going to travel this way and then it will arrive at this point which will travel in tension through this diagonal member and it travels all the way to the foundation and at the foundation you have a reaction, a lateral reaction and an uplift force. As you can tell, the forces will accumulate as it goes from the ridge all the way to the eaves. So let's say, for example, you had 20 kilonewtons running in tension along this diagonal member. On this other diagonal member, you would have more than 20 kilonewtons. Let's say you had 50 kilonewtons, and that is a result of adding up this point load with the component of this diagonal load. So just by understanding this load path, you now are able to optimize your design. Let's say you had a bigger, more complex warehouse and you have more base to the right hand side. So that means maybe the first two base, I'm going to use 12 millimeters rod, round bars. And then on the other three bays, I'm gonna use 16 millimeters rods. And then in the, in the other bays, I might choose to use some, some angles, which have higher capacity. A very simple way that you can actually calculate these forces is by something we call the method of joints. You have the applied forces in one of these five points, and then you have the member forces, which are represented by these blue arrows. So compression on the struts, tension on the diagonal, compression, tension, compression, tension, and then a lateral force and an uplift force at the foundation. And by the way, generally the purlings are enough to brace the internal rafters in light industrial buildings so that these intermediate struts are not necessary, but they're really helpful in providing stability during construction. So you've got the ridge struts and you've got the eaves struts. And they also provide some redundancy if anything happens to your roof diaphragm 
these struts might hold everything together. Also, if you have one bay at the beginning and one bay at the end, you've got two options. You can either share the loads between the two bays. So half goes to this one and half goes to the other one. But then you would have to check the purlins if they can take that compression loads and they can transfer the loads between, between bays. Or you can design one bay to take the full loads and then the other bay will take also the full loads when the wind blows from the other direction. With the cross bracings, if you have two diagonals, one will go into compression and the other one will go in tension. But since these bracings are typically slender round bars or angles, they have virtually zero compressive capacity. So basically when you have a force in this direction, this member will try to take it into compression, but since it's not strong enough, it will just buckle and the force will travel all the way through until this member gets engaged in tension. That's why when you model these members in a software, you assign them as tension only members so that the software doesn't put loads into it. Otherwise, when you design the structure with the software, it will fail it because it buckled. These are the basic principles. And if you understand them, you can adapt your structure to any situation. Just a quick check on the Bang Lab community. It's growing super fast and we're adding more lessons all the time. Link is below if you want to join. For example, let's say you can't have the two end bays braced. Well, that's fine because we can move the bracings to the second bay. So from the last bay to the second one. And I'll add some extra struts. So I've got one, two, three, four, five extra struts that will transfer those point loads all the way to my bracing bay. And again, you are able to play around with the layout because you understand the principles. You know that the force that goes into these points, therefore you added some struts and the loads will just travel in compression into these struts and then get to the bracing bay. Or maybe I need to extend the bracings over two bays like this. Now I can even use tubular sections if I want to because I won't be crossing the members. And the only difference is that I'll have to add these two extra struts to take the intermediate point loads. And we can even go a little bit further in the analysis. If we look from the top, remember that we had a truss. So that was our truss, horizontal truss. In the same way, we also have a horizontal truss, but now our truss is higher. Well, if you have a taller bane or if you have a taller truss, that means the compression forces on the cords will be smaller. So that's another advantage that you got from the system and you only know that because you understand the basic principles. Steel bracings can be used in many type of buildings. So take this timber sports center built in Brisbane. Same analysis, you can see the struts, the timber struts running along the entire length of the building. They go all the way from the end walls to the bracing bay. The forces will travel to the vertical cross bracings at the sides, exactly like we've seen in the previous example. Again, these forces will be resolved into a uplift and lateral component exactly at the top of the concrete column. And because there are windows in between those columns, we cannot continue the cross bracings all the way to the ground. Therefore, you have to resolve these forces at the top of the concrete column. And the way you do that is by cantilevering those concrete columns out of the ground. So you basically have a fixed connection at the base and with a point load at the top. So that lateral force will have to be taken by this cantilever column. The uplift force will just have to make sure that that timber column is properly tied to the concrete column and the concrete column is properly tied to the ground. But then what if those one, two, three concrete columns are not strong enough to cantilever out of the ground? Well, that means you would have to install all these struts that run along the entire length of the building and those struts will distribute the loads among all these concrete columns. Now that lateral point load that was supposed to be in one concrete column is being distributed by all the concrete columns along the building. Well, what if my frame is super tall? Or maybe 
my base are very narrow. Well, instead of running just one cross bracing along the entire height of the frame, you can divide them into two cross bracings and have a strut in the middle. The diagonal bracings, they usually work very well with an angle between 30 and 60 degrees. And if you have a tall frame or very narrow bay, that's when you should be dividing the bay with more cross bracings and adding a strut in between these cross bracings. Have a play, shift the base, throw some doors and windows in and see how you can still make the bracing work and then look at what changed in the load path. If you can do that, you won't have any trouble designing real life structures because real jobs are never as neat as the textbook. There's always a clash or a change that you have to deal with and the layouts will always move and you have to relocate members so nail the load path first and then you can start sizing and detailing the bracing system. Okay, so now that we know where the loads go, let's go through some bracing types and see when we should use each one of them. The first type of bracing is the one that we've been talking about the whole video and it is the cross bracing. They're cheap and light and as I said, only one leg works at a time which is the one in tension. They're great for walls and roofs where access openings aren't required. They can be solid round bars, which requires pre-tensioning with turnbuckles. If it's a roof bracing, the pre-tensioning will help to avoid sagging of the bracing. They can also be tubular sections or angles. You wouldn't pre-tension them though. So in this case, you would have to design them also as a beam to make sure they don't sag too much under their own self weight. Some engineers hang the bracings off the purlings, but I'm not sure if that's more economical because you have to fabricate the hangers and bolt them through the purlings. So these cross bracings are also used a lot in houses raised out of the ground, like this modular house I designed on the Sunshine Coast. And you can also find cross bracings in different type of buildings, like timber framing and lightweight steel framing. We usually call them straps. They work very well for both roofs and walls, and you can also use them as a double diagonal bracing over two bays. And this one is really good if you're having trouble getting your footings to work for uplift, because in this case, you distribute the loads over two bays. The next type of bracing is the single diagonal strut. They will work in tension or compression depending on the direction of the force and they're great to keep doors and windows clear. The downside is that since they also work in compression, you might have to use heavier and more robust sections. I mainly use tubular sections, so that would be square hollow sections or circular hollow sections or maybe rectangular hollow sections. In residential buildings, I like to use the square hollow sections, especially if they're hidden inside the walls because the stud walls can be easily installed around the struts. And let me tell you something, residential buildings generally require a steep structure because we work with brittle materials like bricks, plasterboards, and even small movements can crack the ceilings and walls. That's why I would much prefer using a braced frame with a strut than a portal frame, for example, because the braced frame is way stiffer than the portal frame. The next type of bracing is the K frame or K bracing. And we mostly use them when you want to keep some areas clear. We've got a vertical K bracing, a horizontal K bracing, a double horizontal K bracing. And for example, in this case, a diagonal cross bracing or a single diagonal strut would clash with the door. And also be mindful that if you're using something like this underneath a beam or a rafter, those struts will take some loads from the beam and the rafter. So make sure you account for that or you even design a slotted connection that allows for movement. And of course, nothing of what I said in this video will work properly if you don't design the connections for the bracings properly. If you want a video on this topic, write in the comments the golden rules of steel bracing connections. And if there's enough interest, I'll make a video on that. But for the time being, you can watch this video here to understand how bracings can reduce the buckling effective length of columns. And I'll see you there.